All right, guys. So today we're going over the home inspections. This is all about home inspections. And I'm glad I have a couple bets on here because they'll be able to chime in. Um, but the whole purpose is to go through the home inspection report. We'll see if we have time to go through both the property and the termite one. And I really want to point out, you know, kind of some of the main parts of the inspection report, what to look for, how to interpret certain things, um, maybe how to explain things to a client if you need to, what to say, what not to say, just kind of all the do's and don'ts of an inspection report, because this is going to be a crucial part to your business. Anytime you're going to go out there and show a client a home uh, and potentially write an offer, you're going to want to review the reports, right? And that's going to uh, determine how you write the offer, whether you have contingencies, whether you need to do more research, whether you need to get your own inspection report. Sometimes you may need to get a second opinion, depending on what's on those reports or how old the reports are as well. Um, the other reason this is important is when you're dealing with sellers as well, you want to be able to understand what you're selling, what's wrong with the house before you put it on the market. If there's anything we should address beforehand, because we want to give our put our best foot forward when we put our property on the market. We don't want the buyers to get scared off from an inspection report. So a lot of times we want to take care of certain things and address them before you put it on the market. So we have the best offers presented forward. Um, so guys, uh, this isn't going to be like, hey, let's read through the report together. I'm going to go, it's kind of an overview, but you, you are expected, guys, to actually get a report and read them. I'll send you the link to these ones so you can actually spend some time reading line by line and getting familiar with them. Um, but I'm going to kind of quickly go over how I look at reports, and, and then we'll get some feedback from some of our senior agents as well on, on what you guys do. Um, and these reports are from a property that we just uh, sold, actually, for Blanca, for Todd. So these are sample reports, guys, just FYI. So I'm gonna pull up the inspection report. All right, let me know if you guys can see my screen. Give me a thumbs up if you can. Perfect, okay. So this is an inspection report, um, a sample report for a property that we were working on. And this one was done by Hometown Inspections. I think that's Mario. Mario's the guy that we work with on that. Um, he's been in inspections for a long time. We actually were referred to Mario through our previous home inspection company that we work with. Um, he was with them for a long time. I think they closed down and then he went off on his own and kind of did his own thing. And we've been working with them since. So let's get to the meat and potatoes, guys. Inspection report. On the beginning, you're always going to see the property address and probably some photos of the subject property. And as you scan through, you'll see the company name, the inspector, their license numbers and all that stuff. So FYI, the inspectors do need to be licensed um, to give these home inspections. And then you get to the table of contents, guys. So this is a great page to understand, which is just going to break down where to find certain information, right? It's a quick, a quick one. Um, and these are all the different sections that it breaks it down in. You have roofing, exterior, site elements, garage, attic, bathrooms, depending on how many there are. There's A, B, and C here. There's, so there's three bathrooms. There's your kitchen, your interior, your foundation, uh, foundation area, water penetration, electrical, cooling, heating, plumbing, water heater, foundation slab. And then if there was a pool on this one, they might've done something with the swimming pool here and you'll see that information there. Now, one thing to note about inspections is that if there's a pool, that's an additional cost, right? If they have to do like a pool inspection. So that's usually an add-on. If they're gonna check all the pool equipment, um, you can always hire like a pool inspector just to do a separate one. Or if your current inspector does them, then you can just get like a package deal and include it in one report. A roof inspection as well, um, if you wanted to get like a inspection just on the roof, that's pretty common. What people do, if, especially if they wanna know how much it costs for repairs and stuff like that, that would be a separate report. Whereas in the home inspection here on the roof, it's pretty much gonna be like a visual inspection. They're gonna go up there, they're gonna check it out. They're gonna point out 
maybe anything that they see, but they're not gonna give you an actual estimate of the costs. So with these type of uh, home inspection reports, you're not gonna see estimates of costs unless you were to go get like a contractor or get a roofing specialist or like a pool specialist or a foundation specialist. That's when you'll actually get how much things cost. This is really just gonna give you an overview of the current condition of that particular section, right? Of the roof, the exterior, and it'll kind of break those things down. And then from there, it's up to you if you wanna do more investigation after that. So let's kind of go through this. And then uh, my senior agents that are on here, if you guys have anything to add, um, please raise your hand and I'll call on you because you guys probably look at these more often than I do. Um, so there may be stuff that I'm missing here. Um, so you'll see at the top guys, it's important the date. This is when actually inspection was done. This is the time it was done, the property, who the customer was, who ordered the inspection or who the agent was. This part's important guys, because the date is gonna tell you, right? Obviously when or how far back the inspection report was done. I would say a good, a good rule of thumb is if it was done like in the last 30 days or maybe even up to 90 days, then you, know, you can use these reports and rely on them a little bit more. If it's past 90 days, then I might recommend getting a brand new inspection done because in 90 days, you know, things can change. Sometimes you have inspections that were done six months ago and they're, those are being presented with the property when it's listed. And I've seen cases where we did a brand new inspection um, and there was all kinds of other stuff that showed up on the report, additional things that have transpired within the last 90 days. Uh, Miles said, uh, sewer lateral inspections are mainly in the East Bay. Yes, that's correct. In the East Bay, um, in certain counties, I think in Alameda County, they require a sewer lateral inspection or in certain cities. And that's a whole nother thing where they go out and check the main pipe that runs from the street to the house. And that's an additional inspection that needs to be done. And that one I think is required in order to sell the property. Whereas these ones here, like the property and termite are not required. They're just something that's more customary now where they're provided up front or the buyers will do them up front. And I would say in our market, probably 90% of the time, the sellers will do these up front and provide them when they put their house for sale. Um, this first page is just going to be kind of all like the legal jargon of what the scope of the inspection is, you know, talks about building codes. This is probably just like a disclaimer that the inspection company has to put on there by law. It's going to define like some of the key definitions. So you'll see this as we go through the sections. Um, you'll see some that says inspected, not inspected, not present or repair or replace. That's usually how they're going to give them a grade. So, and you'll see that in a second, like the plumbing, it can have like, did they inspect it? Did they not inspect it? Or do they recommend repair or replace? Or was it not present in the house, right? Because some houses may not have certain features. And then the other thing to keep in mind is, there is time, there are times when certain things are not inspected on the property. And that could be because they didn't have access to it at the time. Or maybe like when people move, for example, a lot of times they'll stack their garage with all kinds of boxes. And sometimes they may have the boxes in front of the furnace, the heater, and the inspector couldn't access it. That's why it's really important to check if everything was inspected or if you have some, or if you have to send them back out there or if you're listing a property to make sure that all those areas are accessible so that it can be included in the report. Because the last thing you would want to have is like an incomplete report, which is going to delay the process and you're going to have to go back out there and check things out. All right, so let's keep it going. Cosmetic defects. Um, Remember, the inspector is not looking for like how nice something is, right? Is it nice? Is it remodeled? Is it anything like that? They're more looking for, is it serviceable? Meaning, is it in working condition? They're not really looking for cosmetics, right? Because you can have like an old house that's not maybe cosmetically appealing, but everything works fine, right? Or you could have something that looks really nice, but it's broken, right? Vice versa. So it's not about cosmetics. It's mostly about, is it working and stuff like that. 
it says also here that you shouldn't use this as a bid, right? And so if you want to bid, that's when you got to go get a contractor. You got to get a contractor who can do the work. But this can be a guide that you can show your contractor and say, hey, check out my report. And then they can give you a rough bid based off those things. And we've had that done a lot of times. Sometimes we'll get our reports done and then we'll send it over to our contractors and they'll say, okay, roughly that would cost about, you know, X amount of dollars. If you want a final bid, I'd have to go out there and inspect the property, but they can at least give you a, a ballpark, which can help, um, you know, with the decision of moving forward or not. Um, they're going to talk about the type of building here. Was there anybody in, uh, there during the inspection? Sometimes the clients might be there. Sometimes the agents might be there. So right here, it says the client and the agent was there. Uh, single family, two story, 66 years old. They're looking at the soil. It was dry. Is the home occupied or non-occupied? How was the weather? What was the temperature? Was there any rain in the last few days? Which is important as well, because if it was raining today and you see water, you don't want to mistake that for a leak if it was just rain, right? So things like that also come into play. All right, we're going to go through a couple of these for the sake of time, because uh, there's 51 pages on this, right? So we're going to go through a few of these. So let's look at the roof. And you'll see right here at the top, you have like this little key here. The IN is inspected, NI not inspected, NP not present, RR repair or replace. So you'll see roof and it's pretty self-explanatory, right? The roof covering, the style, estimated age, he doesn't know, inspection method, he went on the ladder and checked it. Uh, special limitations, the height of roof, design of roof, restrictive visibility. Not all areas visible recommend further evaluation by a roofing contractor. And this makes sense because it was a two-story property, right? So his ladder is only going to get him so far. He may not have been able to walk on the roof. He may just have to go up there and kind of look around and give his rough estimate, right? But basically he says inspected. He's not recommending any uh, repair or replacement. And then he's kind of giving you some more details. There's always going to be photos of everything they inspect, right? Exposed flashing, any comments? If there's nothing to comment on, they're just going to leave it blank. They're only going to comment when it's something that maybe that needs to be addressed or they, they need to point out. He's looking at the vent covers. He's looking at the skylight. And this is important right here. I'm going to give you an example. On the skylight, you'll see he put a, uh, this is like a standard probably thing anytime there's a skylight. It just says skylights are particularly prone to leakage and may need periodic repair or resealing. Integrity of the flashing is generally to the first to consider when leaking occurs. Surface damage or loss of the seal can occur, but such a defect may not be readily apparent during an inspection. So all this is telling is just like, hey, if you have a skylight, these can leak over time. He doesn't see anything now. But the point I'm trying to make is you don't wanna say, oh, you see the word leakage, you don't wanna think there's a leak going on with the skylight. That's not what he's saying. The, some of this is just standard verbiage, just letting you know skylights need to be checked periodically because they can leak. Um, so if it's all like in the first category, the, the first box check, that means it's pretty much in, you know, in decent shape. Then you'll see here, this one has on the right. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more so you guys can see this a little better. Fascia or soffits. So this one has repair or replace. The wood fascia at the eave on the exterior in areas is damaged, further deterioration may occur if not repaired. Qualified contractor should inspect or repair is needed. This is basically where the wood meets and where the, uh, what do you call it, gutters, where the gutters meet. I would say like on 99% of the homes out there, you have this issue right here. It's just because these are areas that get hit with water a lot, especially by the gutters. And most of the time, you're going to have some water damage over time, right? So anytime you have pretty much any house out here where the rain hits, the fascia, which is basically the wood trim that goes around here and the gutters, you, you're always going to have some sort of maintenance or reoccurring water that gets into these areas. Now, how bad is it? That really depends on, you know, how often it's maintained or changed. But like, I know if I go outside of my house right now, I'll see this probably in multiple spots in the corners. Right, so this is not a bad thing. This is actually a really common thing. Anything you guys can add? Any of my senior agents? Any, any I mean, addition? 
Enrique, I mean, again, you know, I mean, I don't look at these quite often, but there, when I was doing this, I, what I what I like to let the clients know and let them understand, and, and even our agents, is that they're buying a used home, right? So it, it's not going to be in perfect shape. Even if you get a new build, the inspectors are going to find something, right? So yeah. just make sure that we go into it. You know, if you're buying a used car, it's the same concept, right? There's going to be nicks. There's going to be paint chips. There's going to be things that are going to be, you know, not perfect with the property. So I just want us to make sure when we're looking at this report, we understand that. And then also that, that again, you know, we're, we're looking for major things that are wrong with the property or things that may need more research done, right? And I think Enrique is probably going to go digger, uh, deeper into that. But my biggest thing, when I'm looking at these, these reports, I just, I want to make sure the client understands like, hey, listen, there, it's, nothing's going to be perfect. That's the, the inspector's job is to point these little things out so you're aware of it. Correct. Yeah, that's good insight. Blanca, what do you got? Yeah, so I want to chime on. Sorry, Maori. <laughs> yeah. So uh, just to just to add to this, if you're looking at this inspection report and you're representing the buyer, the feedback or the feeling based on the roof is that they have no idea of the age of the roof. Um, and it seems like maybe it would be required or recommended to have a roof inspector to go out there. Before you order a roof inspection, check with the listing agent or go through additional seller disclosures to see if the seller has disclosed the age of the roof. In this scenario, it's a brand new roof with permits, which is only a year old. So um, we were able to provide that to the buyer so that the buyer now has information on the roof. So do a little more digging around before you have your buyers go and spend money on additional inspections just to make sure that you do the research and you know if indeed it requires further investigation. Yeah, that's a great point that you brought up because on the surface, you would look at this report and since there was limited inspection on it, right? Because it's a two-story, he wasn't able to walk on the roof. But in fact, this particular property, the roof was changed a year ago. So it's a brand new roof, right? So like Blanca said, always ask the questions. And then remember this, inspection report is only part of all the disclosures that are provided. Last week, we did the training on looking at the, the transfer disclosure and the seller questionnaire, which has more information on there about the age of the roof. So you kind of got to put the puzzles, the pieces of the puzzle together. And then from there, you make your recommendations to your client. Um, but just FYI, 99% uh, of the houses anywhere are going to have this little E uh, issue right here, where there's water intrusion. And then here in California, I would say majority of the houses have some level of termite or dry rot. It's just a matter of to what extent. It's just, it's just uh, that goes with the territory of where we live at. And, and since ter uh, termites are common out here. Um, so section number two is exterior. And you'll see like the chimney, right? The chimney is also something that can be inspected on its own. You'll see in this case, it wasn't inspected because the, you know, the inspector is not gonna climb up and check the chimney. This is a general property inspection. So just a reminder, it's not a specific report on just one section. So if you wanted the chimney report, there's actually companies that will do just a chimney inspection. Um, but he's gonna comment on what type or what uh, material it is or what he recommends. So he put recommend a certified chimney sweep inspector. Inspect further if you wanted more info. You'll see stucco, the stucco coating at the exterior has some cracks. Deterioration can eventually occur if not corrected. I recommend prep and paint using a qualified contractor. So even though he recommends repair, it's not a big deal. And that's the thing is understanding what are major deals and what are not major deals. Let me um, stop sharing real quick. So some of the things that are going to be like major costs is when you have like a foundation issue, right? And even with foundation, there can be small cracks in the foundation, which are not that big of a deal, or you can have major cracks on the foundation where it's shifting the floor and all kinds of stuff and it's messing up the house. So even when you see foundation issues, you have to verify to what extent um, is the foundation, you know, uh, compromised, but some big ticket items are going to be like plumbing right? Like if you have to completely change out the plumbing, that can be a big ticket item. The roof can be a big ticket item. Windows could be a big ticket item. Foundation. Um, the 
what else? Like the H HVAC system, that can be a big ticket item as well, right? So these are all things where if you see like multiple of these things messed up, this is when you all also have to decide, okay, is this something that I, I want to invest into? Do I want to uh, adjust my offer, you know, based off those things? But the cosmetic stuff, like the paint chipping over here and the little crack in the stucco that needs to be filled and painted, like all little things like that. A lot of those are just small items um, that don't cost so much. Thomas, what'd you have, bro? So what, usually when I go over the property inspection, uh, you want to do that beforehand, before you talk with your client. That way you know what you're talking about. And then a lot of these inspections will have a summary. So you could go over the summary with your clients. The other way to read it is to just look for the photos. Uh, anytime there's a photo, there's something the inspector wants to point out. And then for the property inspection, in terms of the price, talk to a senior agent, figure that out. Here, water damage, just tell the client that that's covered in the pest inspection and there's an actual bid for that. Yeah, uh, good points, Thomas. So that, I'm gonna go over that in a second, the summary, but the summary page, it's good that you brought that up. Anything that was marked as repair or replace is gonna be on the summary page. Right now, I'm kind of going through some of the points to show you guys how to read them. But once you understand how to read them, what I would do is I would just go straight to the summary page and I would read it backwards. I would read that first, figure out what all my items were, and then I would go to that particular section to see a little more detail on what needed to be done where anytime he said repair or replace. Because you got to understand that there's 51 pages, right? And there's, let's say like 30 of those pages, nothing's wrong. There's no issues with any of them. So you kind of want to go to the items that stand out, which is are what your, your clients are going to be concerned with. So let's, let's go over that. And then what Thomas also said was that any water intrusion, uh, like water damage, dry rot, mold, anything like that. Um, and termites, that's going to be on the termite report, which we'll look at in a second. Uh, where am I at? Okay. Okay, so you guys got an idea of how to go through each section, right? And how to like look for stuff, right? This is like the details. And then after you've seen so many of these, you start to notice that they all look the same, right? So then you go down to the bottom. Let me scroll all the way to the end. Uh, where are we at? And I'll come back to go some of, over some of like the important areas. Uh, okay, you'll see here. So this is going to be, where does it start off as summary? All right, summary. So this was page 48, right? So keep in mind, 48 out of 51 pages, we found it here. And this is the summary. And this is where he's going to list, once again, any areas that were marked as uh, do not function um, or should be further investigated or either weren't inspected or anything like that. So this is kind of like your cheat sheet now where you can kind of get straight to the important items. And you'll see on this one, the roofing, right? Because he did mark that as repair or replace on the little wood eaves right here, this little corner, that's gonna be in this area, right? So right off the bat, you can say, okay, when you're starting to try, when you're trying to figure out, okay, what's the damage looking like? What are the costs gonna be? If I wanted to fix these things, you're gonna to go to the summary page and start kind of getting some estimates if you need to. The chimney, right? He wasn't able to inspect the, the chimney. So that's why he put it in there because he wasn't able to really give you uh, his evaluation. The siding, right? Remember it had some cracks in the stucco. He wants you to prep and paint it, which is not a big item, but because he recommended repair or replace, it's in the summary section. Exterior faucets. This is like a water hose. The hose bib missing the anti-backflow install as needed to prevent drinking water contamination. A qualified person should uh, repair as necessary. So I guess this is like a little thing you put on the exterior uh, water hose to prevent contamination. I think a lot of houses don't have this because this is something that I think is newer. Um, not a big deal, guys. 
fireplace. The fireplace wasn't inspected. The liners for furnace or fireplaces were not inspected. I recommend the chimney sweep. So anything that has to do with fireplace and chimney, um, it's usually gonna be a specialist who can inspect that stuff. The interior, as you see here, maybe this is why it wasn't inspected or that's just a photo. I think it's just the photo. So whatever he's gonna mention, he has to put a photo of it. So he's just giving you a photo of the fireplace. The foundation. So on the foundation, there was a pier or a column. It has a cracked post strap. Uh, cracked post strap as needed, replace. So repair, replace. So it looks like one of these posts or something on there has a crack in it. Again, this is not a big deal. Like this is something that you could probably pay a couple hundred bucks to replace. But since it had a crack in it, he had to mention it. That's exactly, That's exactly what he said. Yeah. That it was just like a hundred bucks to repair that post. Yeah, because all it is is a piece of wood, right? And remember, a lot of these houses, like there's different types of foundation, but this one has like piers. So there's a lot of these little wood posts all through holding up the foundation. So they probably just got to go in there take that one out, put a new one in, secure it, and you're done. Might be a couple hundred bucks to fix that. Now, if you had a bunch of these that were all cracked and messed up, that might be something concerning, right? Where you may say, hey, why are multiple of these messed up and cracked? And do I need to go get a foundation inspector, a specialist out there, right? The good thing about Mario, from what I know, is he actually, uh, he has specialty in foundation because he's been doing this so long. So a lot of times he's able to either give us an additional report if we want it, or he's at least able to tell us a little bit more if we need some more information. Enrique, can, can, yeah. we, uh, can you go over and maybe, maybe explain your guys' dialogue that you would have with the client once you're reviewing a port, like let's say it did have multiple cracks in these on these peers mm -hmm. you know how what, what kind of dialogue would you have with your client right how would you direct them at that point yeah it's a great question um i think number one is i would do my research first right i would do my research first and i would find out a little bit more before i have the dialogue because the last thing i want to do is be unprepared and then i would also make sure that uh if i don't have a lot of experience in this i'm not gonna try to speak too much as to my opinion, because the last thing you wanna do is advise someone incorrectly, right? Now, fortunately for me and Jason, we have a lot of experience you know, with fixing houses, remodeling, and we've done this a lot of times because we've invested into a lot of properties. So I'm able to speak a little bit more openly with clients because I have experience. I've dealt with foundation issues. We've, we've uh, renovated properties that have foundation issues. We've sold properties for clients that have foundation issues. So we have more experience in that arena. But if you're newer or you're not as experienced in a certain area, you're gonna wanna get the info first and kind of play the neutral role, right? Play the neutral role. So if I was a new agent and I was, I would first call Mario and say, hey Mario, I noticed this has some you know, foundation stuff. Can you tell me a little bit more so I can have a conversation with my client, all right? Um, I would also ask the client if they wanted to jump on a call with the inspector, right? Because the inspector is, I'd rather show them how to get the info than me be responsible for the information, right? Because if I say, hey, this is what you got to do, that makes me responsible, right? Because the client is, is basing their judgment off of what you told them. And if I don't really know, then I would leverage the person who knows. I would leverage the contractor. I would leverage the inspector, you know, and I would say, hey, Let's say it had multiple posts that were uh, that were damaged or compromised. I would say, hey, it looks like there's some issues with the foundation, right? To what extent? I don't know to what extent, but it looks like there's multiple posts that have that have been compromised. I spoke to the inspector. This is what the inspector is telling me, but this is what I recommend, right? Before we move forward, I recommend either we jump on a call with the inspector so that you can feel comfortable and hear exactly how he presents the information. Or if he feels that it's necessary for us to get a foundation inspector out there, then I recommend we get an inspector out there. So at least we have peace of mind as to what you're dealing with and what you're getting yourself into. And then at that point, we can determine, do we move forward? Do we renegotiate? Is this something that we can live with? You know, and we go from there. 
And that's exactly how I would have the conversation. But you see what I'm doing is I never told him like, yes, no, do this, do that. I'm more saying, hey guys, this is how the information was presented. This is what I found out. This is what I recommend so that you're comfortable. You know, and then ultimately it's going to be the client's decision um, to make, you know, to decide if they want to go forward or not. Right. Does that make sense, guys? Anything else you guys want to add, Jay or Blanca or, or Thomas, on how you address these conversations? I, I go the I same go way. The same way. Yeah. I usually um, get the inspector on the phone with the clients just because, like you said, they they explained it a little more in detail and they can advise on some rough estimate cost or advise if further inspection is needed. Um, and like you said, I think it's always better they hear it from the expert. We're not inspection experts. We're not foundation experts. And sometimes we could say things that may hold us liable for stuff that we may share unwantingly. So at all times, when it's something that you're not in your expertise, it's better just to get them on a call with the inspector. Or if it's something simple um, that you can just relay, hey, I spoke to the inspector, this is a feedback, you're welcome to call him, you know, kind of put it in their, in their court so that they're doing a little more of the research. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Good advice. Thomas, you had something? Question? Yeah, when I'm representing the buyers and uh, there isn't inspections done on the property, more it's done now, but sometimes you'll come across a property that doesn't have it and we need to get inspections done, I would invite the buyers to come along. So that way, when the inspectors are done, they do their summary and go over it in person with the clients. Yeah, that's... Then... Go ahead. And any questions that the clients may have they can ask the inspector who is the professional that can answer their questions. Got it. What I would, um, what I would recommend, cause that that's kind of a double-edged sword sometimes in my experience. So let me tell you what I would recommend. I definitely think having the client ask questions to the inspector directly is a good idea, but I don't know if they physically need to be at the appointment. And some inspectors actually prefer that the clients aren't there so that they can hurry up and get to their, kind of go through it or maybe showing up at the end or maybe doing a conference call at the end with the inspector. Because what the last thing you want to do is you get the client there and they're just like hovering over the inspector the whole time. Right. And the inspectors can get annoyed. Like, Hey, let me do my job. And then once we're done, then I'll give you the information. So yeah, I've, I've had that backfire sometimes. You usually have everybody wait at the end for the summary. Yeah. So for the summary at the end, Definitely, uh, you can do something like that. But here's what you also got to think of, right? And this is also thinking like from a business standpoint, whether you're there for the summary or whether you just make a phone call, it's the same result, right? And driving all the way out to the property, having your client <laughs> come out there, taking away time from you know, other clients you could be servicing or prospecting or, or anything like that is not necessarily... I don't think it's going to be a benefit for you in the long run to your business. In fact, every time I've had a sold a property and I've sold probably thousands or been involved in thousands of, of, of transactions, I've probably only been to one or two inspections, just to be honest. But that doesn't mean I didn't jump on a call with the, with the inspector or that doesn't maybe mean like if I was in the area, I'd show up at the end and just say, Hey, you know, what are we looking at? You know, at the end of it, so what I'm trying to say is, is from the business standpoint, like keep your business moving, but know how to call the client, jump on a call or call them after if you need to. Um, just some advice, guys. Uh, Dewey. Um, so I'm new to this. So do you find an inspection um, information on MOS or do you reach out to the client? Uh, Great question. So yeah, what do you find? So your question is, where do you get the inspection reports from? Yes. Yeah. Great question. So when you have the, uh, when you go on the MLS, it's typically going to be in the private remarks. If inspections were done on that property, the listing agent will usually put a link to all the disclosures and inspection reports. And that will usually be in the private remarks. There should be a link there. Or 
there's actually a way that they can upload it to the MLS and you could just download it to the MLS directly from, from the MLS directly. You can also, um, sometimes they use like, uh, like a third party site like Disclosure IO or one of those where they host the inspection reports and disclosures on a third party site. Some agents want you to message them if you want them so they can email them to you because they want to keep track of who's asking for reports. Mm-hmm. It just depends if they're like an old school agent. Um, I would say in, in our market today where there's probably less offers on properties and there's maybe not as many requests, it may make sense to have a little more control over who sees your reports. This way you can have an opportunity to engage with the agent and ultimately sell the property, right? See what it's going to take to get the property sold. Um, and that's just market specific, right? Because the market is a little different now. What other questions you guys got over the inspection report? Kayla, what do you got? Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, so I have a quick question. You said that you don't recommend um, we review disclosures um, past 90 days. Let's say a house was on the market over 90 days. Would my client have to pay for the disclosure inspections to be done? Um, it's all negotiable, right? It's definitely negotiable. But if the seller did them 90 days ago, then the property has been sitting for 90 days. You may want to use that as leverage, you know, mm-hmm. either ask for an inspection contingency or, uh, yeah, and during your inspection contingency, you can do your own reports and we've done that in the past where we do our own reports maybe because they didn't provide us adequate reports or they were old and then we find new things and then we use that to go back and renegotiate with the seller so there's a strategy that can come into play but at the very minimum you're going to want to review those reports and you're going to want to see what you find on there first and then determine if you want to go get additional ones okay Uh, And especially, it's especially important if you have a report that has a bunch of stuff on it, right? If you have an inspection report, let me give you an example. Let's say you have an inspection report that was done four months ago, and there's a bunch of damage on that report. Well, in four months, there could have been more damage done on that report, right? Because if there was already a lot of damage to begin with, then that means the house probably wasn't being taken care of the best. So I would say four months later, things have could, have could have gotten worse. Like if there was a leak, the leak could be causing additional damage. If the furnace was almost ready to go out four months ago, it could have gone out already, right? Four months later. So it's certain things where if the report has a lot of issues and it's old, then you're probably gonna wanna recommend they get new ones. Now, if the report was really clean and everything looks super clean about the property, maybe it was just remodeled, maybe the reports were clean, there was nothing that indicated there may be issues down the line, then you can use your discretion to see if you want to get for, uh, new reports or not. Right? And you're going to want to ask the, 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 the client how they feel about that. But I would always recommend having reports at least within 90 days, guys. The, the earlier, the better. Any other questions, guys? Okay. We're going to move on. Uh, we got about 15 minutes, guys. We're going to move on. We're going to go over the termite report. Termite report is a lot simpler. It's a lot easier to look at. It's a lot shorter as well. The general property is always going to be the long one with all the pages, all the photos and all that stuff. The termite report is strictly inspecting stuff that can be uh, section one or section two, which is going to be anything that has to do with like water damage, dry rot, termites, uh, potential like mold or anything like that. And it's going to come with the, uh, an estimate of the cost as well. Um, so let me pull that one up. And you'll see, um, looks a lot different, right? Can you guys see my screen? Okay. So termite report, this was done by uh, Western Way, which is one of the people we use, the companies. And then the front page is just like a summary page. It's always gonna have a photo 
like a diagram, a makeshift diagram. And then you'll see every little number that they point out, like a 1A, a 2A, a 3A. That's where something was found or identified. And then you're right here in this top section, you'll see these little X's that were checked. Let me make this a little bigger. You'll see uh, it's a complete report. You'll see dry wood termites, fungus or dry rot, other findings and further inspection. These are things that were tagged in there. And as I mentioned earlier, guys, 99% of the homes that we come across here in our area are gonna have something to this effect on there. Sometimes it's minor, sometimes it could be major. One thing you also want to uh, verify is if a garage was inspected or if there's like an additional structure because sometimes those aren't included in the report. So let's say you have like a detached garage that's separate from the property. They may not have inspected the garage if it wasn't, uh, if it wasn't requested. So right here, you'll see general description, two story, single family home, raised foundation, has an attached garage, composition roof and was occupied and furnished at the time of inspection. So same thing like the first one, you'll see all the times and dates they went out there. This is the diagram. This is who was inspected by, their license number, their signature. And then you'll see these little points. And then when you go down, it's gonna give you now an explanation of each of these points that they mentioned. Now, what's important guys is this page right here. This basically tells you uh, it's a sections report, right? And this is important. So there's a section one and there's a section two. And if you read this little paragraph right here, it tells you what that means. This is a separated report, which is defined as section one or section two conditions evident on the date of inspection. Section one contains items that were evident uh, where there's evidence of active infestation, infection or conditions that have resulted in or from infest infestation or infection on the date of the inspection. So basically what that means is anything in section one means that they found something there present on that day. Section two are gonna be conditions deemed likely to lead to infestation or infection, but where no visible evidence was found at the date. Further inspection items are defined as recommendations to inspect, which during the original inspection did not allow inspector to access or complete and cannot be defined as section one or two. So in summary guys, section one is stuff that is happening now. Section two are things that they are deeming likely to happen, right? Like, hey, you got to watch out for this because this can lead to something. And then further inspection means they weren't able to access it or inspect it. So they're recommending you get further inspection. And it's important to know that, right? Because the main things we want to know is section one, because that's going to be things that need to be addressed right now. Section two is like, hey, you got to watch out and look out for these things. And maybe there's some preventative measures that need to be taken. And then, of course, further inspection, if, the, if it wasn't accessible, then you got to decide if you want to get back out there and inspect any areas that weren't accessible. Um, all the other stuff is just kind of like their legal disclaimers. The roof was not inspected. And then we're getting down to like, like they said, section one is active stuff. Section two, likely to lead to something. Further inspection is defined as something that wasn't inspected. So check this out. So you're always, let me see, they're gonna be in categories. So you have dry wood termites and you'll see right here, 2A, section two, dry wood termite pellets as indicated by 2A on the diagram. The pellets appear old and infestation appears inactive. There was a fumigation tag posted by termite biz dated 11-9-2020 for dry wood termites. So this means they inspected the area. They found little pellets, which are basically like the droppings from the termites, but they didn't find any active termites. And then there was also a tag saying that the property was treated for termites back in 2020. Now with this particular property, this property was sold back in 2020. We helped these clients buy the property and then we just helped them sell it two years later. So during that time when they bought it, it looks like the termites were taken care of, but there's still little pellets or little droppings you know, wherever they search, whether it was under the property or anything like that. So the good thing is there's nothing there, but it's just saying 
maybe remove or cover the pellets or just keep an eye on it. Fungus or dry rot, section one. So basically this means something that's active. And this was probably referring to that little corner that we saw on the property inspection report where it says uh, evident at the rafter tail. Rafter tail is like that little wood that goes around the roof right there. And it just basically says there's some fungus damage, which is basically another word for water damage. Um, remove, replace the damaged wood up to one feet of a two by four. And then you can treat it as well. There's some spray that they put on there to make sure everything gets killed. And then you replace the wood, you primer it and paint it, and then you're good to go. Something that costs probably a couple hundred bucks to fix. Uh, section 3B, this is also section one right here, or item 3B, this is section one damage, fungus as well. On the second story, siding trim. Basically the same exact treatment. Remove the piece of wood that's damaged, replace it. They can spray it with this fungus stuff and then they repair it, uh, they paint it and, and install it. Everything else here is just other findings and these are all section two items. Meaning these are things that they just recommend you keep an eye on. So there are cracks at the stucco. And remember on the other report, we saw that there were some cracks in the stucco. We might want to seal these cracks because this is conducive to fungus, right? If you start getting water in there and stuff like that. There's a leak at the plumbing, at the landscaping. So like there's probably like a little pipe or like for the sprinklers or something that had a little leak. You want to maybe get this sealed up. Um, there's earth to wood contact on the fence post. So anytime you have like wood that's in contact with the dirt or anything like that, um, it can get you know moisture and stuff like that. So they, they recommend fixing this or cutting the wood and install something so it doesn't contact. Uh, cracked or deteriorated grout or caulking. I guess this is a wet bar. I think this is outside. Um, there's a leak right here. There's a leak at the sub area of plumbing. So this probably means there's probably a small leak the plumbing that runs under the house, maybe it's a bathroom, maybe it's a toilet, something like that. They're recommending get this checked out. And then you'll see further inspection, vegetation against the siding. That means there's like plants or stuff that's in contact with the siding of the house. They wanna get that area checked out. And then storage in the garage makes the area inaccessible for inspection. Areas of wood destroying organisms or damage may be hidden behind the storage. They weren't able to really inspect the garage because there was probably a bunch of stuff in the garage. Uh, Blanca wrote right here, in the half bathroom, there was a leak, right? So that gives us an answer to that last one, right? Where it says the plumbing. So it's probably the half bathroom. There was probably a leak on the pipe underneath, which is not a big deal, right? Something that probably just needs to be fixed or sealed. And you can see some of the water probably dripping underneath the property. Uh, and that's pretty much it, guys. This is a pretty clean report. It has some minor items on here, but I would say overall, this is a clean report. And then you'll see photos of what they're mentioning right here. So this is some of the damaged wood. You can see some little damages here. You can see some leak right here at the pipe. This is probably the half bath that had a little leak in the pipe right here. That probably needs to be fixed. You can see some of the uh, sprinklers that they said were leaking. So these probably need to be fixed, not a big deal. And that's pretty much it. So anything they mentioned is always gonna have photos at the end so you can know which areas to check out. But when I see this report, guys, I see an overall pretty clean report. Nothing on there is major. Blanca, do you remember how much the uh, section one or how much the termite report came out to? Because I don't have the, the page with the costs. Uh, I believe it was 250. 250 bucks. For the inspection. Yeah. Uh, no, do you know how much the work was like to fix any of those things? Oh, yeah. Um, so the only item that was two items were repaired from from the inspections. One of them was the leak um, in the sub area from that half bath. And the other item that was repaired Ooh. was the right side Ooh. fence in the backyard was leaning. So that got fixed and it was about eighteen hundred dollars total. I'm not. Got it. And you guys fixed that before? Yes. 
yeah, we fixed it um, during um, the listing period. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So Blanca fixed the leak or they had the clients fix the leak. What? When the property was getting listed and then fix a, a fence that was leaning over, they spent about 1800 bucks. But now when the buyers offer on the property, we can say, hey, these items were already corrected, right? Which makes the property now more desirable. Typically with the termite report, there's always an additional sheet. I don't have it right now, but it's a, it's a cost estimate. So it'll have all these items on here and it'll be an estimate of what this company Western way would would charge to fix those items for you, right? So any anytime there's a termite report, these companies, they're also contractors and they can do the work for you and fix it. And then once they fix it, they can also give you a new report saying, hey, we fixed all these things, we corrected them and they give you a report showing that all these items were corrected. And then you can use that when you're marketing the property or you could present that to the buyers just to let them know, hey, this is what we found. We got it corrected. It's been paid for. You're good to go. And then that's that would give you what's called section one clearance, um, which means everything's cleared and, and corrected. All right, guys, we're coming up on time now. Let's take a couple minutes real quick just to see if there's any questions. And then we will get this wrapped up. Any questions that stood out to you guys? Okay, how about this? Really quick, what was the what was the main some takeaways for you guys? Actually, let me do this. Let's go into Slack. I'm gonna put it in Slack right now. If you can do me a favor really quick and just go into Slack and re reply to my message. What was your main takeaway from today's training? So just hit reply. And then type in, let's take a minute to do that now. What'd you learn today or what stood out to you? Leverage the inspectors, yep. Did this... Also, my question to you guys is, did this help clear up some of like the nervousness around inspection reports? Because sometimes inspection reports can seem a little intimidating, right? But when you're able to see like it's not that big of a deal, you know, I, I think that can lead to you going into it a little bit more confidently, right? And I think the big message too to you guys is you don't have to know everything. And so I'm going to leave you with this. There was a saying that I got from someone, I forgot who it was back in the day, but this always stood in my head. He said, know what you know, know what you don't know, and know someone who knows what you don't know. Let me say that one more time. Know what you know, know what you don't know, and know someone or know how to find someone who knows what you don't know, right? And that's the bottom line, right? You're not going to be experts at all, of the, at all of this. The stuff that you do know, present that confidently. If you don't know it, don't try to make stuff up because you don't want to guide the client in the wrong way. You want to stay in your lane, right? And educate yourself. And then once you educate yourself, then you'll be able to speak on this stuff more confidently. But even if you're newer, even if you're a veteran in the game, it doesn't mean you know everything about how these reports work. So, but you still want to move forward and you still want to have the resources of where to find the information. So as long as you can point people to where the resources are, then you're doing your job as the agent and advising them, right? Jay, what do you got? Yeah, no, I just want to add, I know you mentioned this before, but it's extremely important, guys, that you guys download this and actually read a report, right? Read the purchase contract, read the disclosures, so then you're at least familiar with them when you're when you're going to be presenting them to your client. So again, I know that's like the a basic thing, but make sure you guys, it's not just this training, you got to print it out, make sure you guys read the report. Yep. Extremely important. So I'm going to drop these reports in the in the Slack today, guys. This is a property that just got sold. I'll drop the reports in Slack, download them, and just read through them as if you were, you know, interested in a property for a client and you were contacting the listing agent. The listing agent said, here's my inspection reports. 
Go read through them. Look at the summary page. Look at all the stuff we just did right now, because that's what it's going to be on every single inspection report you come across. They may look, some of them may look a little different here and there because it's a different company that provides the report, right? If they're using HomeGuard or whoever it might be. Um, but all the reports have like the same fundamentals, the table of contents, the breakdowns, the summaries and all that. It just may look a little different because it's a different brand or different colors and stuff like that. All the termite reports pretty much look exactly the same because I think that's a standard form they have to use by law. It's just the home inspection reports uh, look a little bit different company to company. Um, all right, guys, that's all I got for you. Uh, please drop me a line, reply to my post in Slack. Let me know what was your biggest takeaway from, from today or something that you learned. Um, Cause this is good, good discussion guys. Let me know if you need anything. Thanks for showing up today. Let's go out there and get it. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Oh, why well, have everyone here? Business planning workshop tomorrow, guys, 1130 at the cherry office. We have lunch. We have some guest agents coming from other uh, teams and stuff as well to join us. We're going to go deep and break down the business and develop our own individual game plans for 2023. And then we have a taco guy as well. I'm just going to throw it out there because I know you guys like food. I got a taco guy for you guys uh, for lunch tomorrow. So make sure you are at Cherry tomorrow for call session and for our business planning and networking session afterwards. See you tomorrow. Let's go. Tacos. Peace out, guys. Thank you.